We can't we can't hear you, Meet. Nope. This is probably the very first time that this happens in an online meeting. So we are experiencing <laughs> a unique uh, event here. She is logging in again, I think. We're connecting to the audio. Do you hear me now? Yes, now we hear you. Yes. Okay. But we can't uh, see so, you anymore. Uh, yeah, now we can. Okay. Um, Big blue button didn't like it that I switched devices. So that's a tip for the next one. <laughs> Don't switch devices in between. But without further ado, good morning, everyone. Thank you for your patience. I hope this soft gray Monday morning is treating you well. We'll be kickstarting. It's not treating you well. <laughs> I can already see nodding. No, but we uh, will be kickstarting your week with a discussion about the health information landscape in Belgium, and it will leave you pondering for the rest of the week. And I hope it will slightly, even just slightly, change the way you think about our health data and how we go about it. We are lucky to have three experts with, with us here today, and uh, we will discuss our health data from three very different angles. I will introduce these three experts very briefly, but they will tell you more about themselves later on. We have Bart Mesure, you can wave at the camera, a scientist at the University of Ghent. We have Karen, uh, she is an economist working as a data analyst and pro project manager at IMA or AIM, that's the intermutualistic agency in Belgium. And we have Brecht de Vleeschauer. Epidemiologist at Cienzano and Professor Risk Analysis at the University of Ghent. We are going to start with a very short introduction. Um, I'm going to ask you, what do you do and why are you here? And I'm going to ask Karen first, what do you do? Explain us a little bit about your job, please. Uh, thank you. Um... So I work at IMA and we are a non-profit organization that gathers all the health claims of the seven Belgian sickness funds. And we gather them in one big database. Uh, these data are made accessible for users. These users are policy institutions. These are researchers, many of universities and also to the public. That right. is, in a nutshell, what uh, we do at IMA. Very, uh, very useful. <laughs> um, and why are you here today? So I hope to learn a lot from the other speakers around the table. Um, and I'm also very curious to hear questions from the public. And we'll be happy to answer. OK, super. That's going to be a nice synergy. Then Bart. Uh, same question to you. What do you do and why are you here? So um, I'm Bart. I'm a postdoctoral, postdoctoral researcher at the, um, the Faculty of Sciences at Ghent University. Um, I'm a computer scientist and my research mainly involves data analysis and um, developing tools for that. Often these projects include biological um, data, such as um, identifying which bacteria are present in samples um, using protein and DNA data. Um, and I also teach a course in data visualization. And I'm here uh, probably because uh, since last summer, I've been um, reporting daily on the current COVID situation in Belgium based on the open data provided by Cienzano. Um, initially, I only did this um, on Twitter where my follower count quickly rose from around 500 to almost 8,000 now, I think, um, including many journalists, politicians, even ministers. Um, and since January, um, VRT News um, calls me every weekday for um, a quick interpretation of the daily numbers for the live blog on um, their website. And in addition to reporting, I have also been uh, campaigning to make more um, data available to the public. So you got a second job during the <laughs> pandemic. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and then Brecht. Um, 
What do you do and what do you hope to get from this session today? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm working as an epidemiologist at CN Sano since 2016, so formerly the Scientific Institute for Public Health. And my main activities are within the Health Indicators Unit of CN Sano, where I try to make best use of all available health data that exists within the Belgian health information landscape to try to uh, give some uh, plausible, sensible ideas of the health status of the Belgian population. So I try to quantify what the diseases are that make us ill, what the risk factors are that cause these diseases, um, what the inequalities in the health status are um, that we are experiencing. Um, so I'm mainly a user, uh, a user, a scientist using all available health information in, uh, in Belgium. Um, I'm also discovering what is available, um, discovering how this is used, how this can be used, how it is not always used to the best possible extent. Um, so this general interest in health information, health data also made me uh, think more about how to make the bridge towards um, uh, other researchers, um, people who might be able to, to use these data, but maybe are not yet aware of what exists and how they can use it. So in that context, uh, we have recently started up a project called AHEAD, which is funded by BELSPO, the Federal Science Policy, which aims to uh, increase the visibility of the Belgian health information landscape, which also aims to bridge the gap between data holders and data users. And of course, we will talk about that later on, also take privacy issues into account. So I see myself as someone who is a bit on both sides of the river bank, uh, trying to see what the needs are, um, what the difficulties are, and trying to think about how we can solve these uh, difficulties. Thank you. That's nice. And uh, why are you here today to discuss that specific part? Indeed, yeah. So I uh, yeah. integrated both questions. Um, so I'm happy to take every opportunity to uh, uh, talk about the Belgian health information landscape and to talk about how this can be valorized to the best possible extent. I'm happy you say that because I wanted to paint a little bit of context. Um, most of us that are here as an audience, I think everyone knows that Belgium has a very rich health information landscape. We're good at this. We have valuable information. Um, who would like to explain a bit more about this information and why it's so valuable? Maybe Brecht, you can can continue on this. Yeah, sure. Um, so the the richness lies in, I think, first of all, the fact that in Belgium we have a, a unique person identifier, which is not necessarily the case in in every country. So this means that we have a, a strong potential to integrate multiple data sources and to uh, strengthen the the valorization potential that we have within each of these data sources. Um, the richness, of course, also lies in the multitude of, um, of data sources, of routine um, data sources on health that we have. And we have, of course, Karen, and I see in the uh, list of, um, of the audience list, uh, many other colleagues from the Intermutualistic Agency. So the information uh, on healthcare use in Belgium is an extremely valuable source. Uh, it is nationally representative and uh, exhaustive, more or less. Um, we also have other important data sources, such as the, uh, the hospital discharge data uh, managed by the Ministry of Health, the causes of death data managed by StatBel, the cancer registry, um, different survey surveillance systems managed by Ciensano. Um, so I've now mentioned many different organizations, and this also shows a bit the, the limitations that we have, because these different sources fall under the responsibilities of different organizations. And in Belgium, we don't yet have one single national um, health database or a system that allows to, in a routine way, integrate all of this information. This is the case in Denmark, this is the case in Scotland, some other countries, but not in Belgium. So the richness lies in the fact that we have a lot of good sources. We have the possibility to integrate the sources but the challenges also lie in the um yeah 
complicated uh, processes that we need to go through to have access and to integrate and further valorize uh, these sources. We'll get into these challenges in a moment. Um, I did forget to mention if anyone in the audience has questions you would like to ask yourself, because as Brecht mentioned, there's a lot of people, a lot of colleagues around. I bet you have some very burning questions. Um, you can drop them in the chat for later and we can answer them. Um, and make sure that you in the chat maybe give a virtual applause already to the people that are here with us today. Um, Brecht, you mentioned, uh, yeah, we have a lot of good resources. It might be complicated. Those challenges we're, we're going to pick up later, but maybe Bart can shed a light on the opportunities that lie here in the open landscape, given the fact that you have now a second job during the pandemic. Um, yeah, sure. Um... I think you, you have to make distinction between two types of data. Um, on the one side, you have open data, and the definition of open data is it's publicly available. Everyone can do with it, whatever he wants, reuse it in any way. Um, so that's one thing. And then on the other side, you have data that's potentially available for research, um, which is maybe more privacy sensitive. Um, from my research and, and for the, the reporting I've been doing in the last few months, I've been mainly focusing on the, the open data. So basically reusing what's out there um, and yeah, valorizing it, getting more out of the data than, than um, the official instances are doing. Um, and then next to that, of course, you have the research data and there um, yeah, you have more challenges first. You have to know what's out there because it's not as publicly listed as, as the open data, which you uh, might stumble upon. Um, and then um, secondly, uh, you have to get access to the data, uh, which sometimes involves uh, an application process, a reviewing board, um, some legal limitations. Um, you might not have experience with yourself as a researcher. Yes, I know that Karen has already put a lot of thought in this. Um, Karen, can you maybe explain us a little bit about these challenges that we face, because I hear, I hear a board, I hear, hear an application process, legal limitations. How does that work on your side? Um, yeah, I, if I can pick in on uh, what Bricht already said, uh, indeed to integrate the different databases on health in Belgium, uh, we need to, uh, take some step forward in the legal, uh, technical and ethical issues to make that more um, easier for users to get access. Um, we at IMA um, make our data available, so our data are also subject to um, uh, GDPR regulation. We have of give an idea of our data in our data uh, set um, we have all claims data of the Belgian uh, compulsory health insurance that means that each record in our database is one uh, healthcare provision a doctor visit a drug prescribed uh, to you uh, a blood test and so on so our data contain more than 1 billion records of by uh, per year and of these records we have all kinds of uh, individual information what is the patient what is the doctor what is the date and so on so you see that this is highly um, sensitive information that has to be protected from misuse um, but we make it assess accessible for our specific database and also one our data want to be linked to other sources the legal technical and ethical issues are already in place. And maybe that is uh, a bit early in the discussion, but what we are working on for the moment, that is to help users in this access, because even if the technical issues are in place, the pathway can be, can be very long and very difficult. So we try to help user by ad hoc services, ad hoc support, and also by developing generic tools that help users to, to interpret, to understand the data. 
but uh, maybe I can elaborate on that further later in the discussion. Yeah, maybe Bart can can pick in on this because you probably have some experience now with with yeah getting getting access. How did how did this go for you? Um, well, I'm I'm a big fan of getting more of the restricted data to the open data part. Um, for some data, like you said, it it isn't possible because of the privacy sensitivity. Um, but for other data, if it's aggregated on a high enough level, that shouldn't be a concern. Um, but right now, in, in in this current pandemic, we still see that that some data that's available and could be made available isn't. Um, for example, um, the the number of tests that are um, executed uh, by age uh, category, um, those data are available, are uh, aggregated, so not privacy privacy sensitive. Um, and are kept from the general public for um, some reasons, for example. Um, and as a researcher, you probably could get access to the data if you um, requested it, but then you would be heavily, heavily limited in what you could do with it. So uh, you wouldn't be able to publicly announce those data. Would you like to reply, Kai? Because maybe you already have some. Yeah, I, I understand perfectly well what, uh... Uh, Bart is, um, yeah, his uh, his requests are. So we also make our data available in aggregate statistics in um, an open database that is called the IMA Atlas. There you find a lot of statistics about 20 teams. We have a few hundred indicators that are um, available by individual characteristics, age, sex, and also by detailed geographical location. So not only in municipality, but even the neighborhood where people live. And these data are really open data, but the problem we have, that is time and, 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 and capacity. It, it takes a lot of work to prepare these data. We are expanding these indicators every year, and we are even developing tools to get more indicators at a regular pace in these database um, so on the one hand you have to have the capacity but on the other hand um, it's not always clear what users really want to see in these open data um, I, I uh, we have now a few hundred indicators in our data but we we are the type of statistics that you can derive for, um, or from our data are endless. So it's not always very clear what are the most useful statistics to make, pub to make public in such an open database. So for that, for the moment, we try to respond to requests from or needs from our partners. So when new statistics are developed, that is in line with a study of our partners, that is in line with uh, demands from other partners. So that is the way we try to fill this uh, gap. But you're on both sides. What happens? Yeah, thanks. Um, so indeed, I, I understand Bart is a question, and this is, a, he's, uh, of course, not the only one asking this question. Also have to say, of course, that I'm uh, even though I work at Cienciano, I'm not the person making the decision, so I cannot comment on the the specific question. Um, but some I have some general thoughts on the open data issue, especially linked to COVID. And I think we all agree that COVID has been a huge uh, shock for society, but it has also been a shock for health data, leading to some very positive uh, effects, but also some very negative effects that we all have to um, face with. Um, one of the positive effects is that it has shown what the value can be of open data. And um, in the past, as Karen has also mentioned, there have been some initiatives to work towards interactive databases. Uh, open data actually still remained rare, so that the, the actual availability of machine-readable um, data sets still remained rare in Belgium in, in the health landscape. Um, so one of the positive aspects that we can take from the COVID crisis is that we have now very good examples, thanks to Bart amongst others, but he's definitely one of the best, uh, very good examples of the, the added value of having these open data. Um, it allows people to 
uh, to make their own models. And we have uh, Kuhn de Forche, who is uh, regularly updating his models on and making them available through Twitter. Very valuable. Um, it also helps uh, people to uh, sometimes confirm the messages that we as an organization uh, draw from the uh, data or maybe come with new messages, things that we have missed. So all of this is, to me, a very huge advantage of, of open data. Um, but as I said, it also led to some negative consequences. And one of the main ones being the, uh, the increased attention to data privacy. Um, I don't know if you need to go into details of, of GDPR, but uh, GDPR has some restrictions on the use and reuse. and uh, uh, of, of health data. At the same time, GDPR is not very explicit on what is possible or what is not possible. So it allows for a lot of different interpretations. And what we see, uh, this is an observation, is that the, the attention drawn by the COVID crisis to health data um, is making some people, some organizations to be even more critical on what they want to share or how they want to share their data. So again, this is something that we have to understand. Um, we have to talk about data privacy, talk to the, the privacy advocates. Um, but we also have to counter that with a positive scientific um, uh, message um, with some very positive examples. And one of the best examples that we've recently seen was the studies done in Scotland where they were able to use um, the data from all the people living in Scotland linked together to uh, to prove the effect of uh, the single dose AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca vaccine a few weeks after uh, the vaccination campaign had started. So this is a very positive scientific message that being able to use such data, which are privacy sensitive, yes, but being able to use such data can help save lives. And this is something that we need to put more in the in the forefront um, to be able to prove that uh, using such data with all the restrictions that are in place and that are necessary, but using such data to support population health remains a very crucial thing uh, that we as scientists uh, should be able to uh, continue doing. Are we ready to start doing something like this in Belgium right now? Well, if we were to replicate exactly what they have done in Scotland, then I'm afraid that uh, this today would be science fiction in Belgium for many reasons. Um, processes in Belgium take much more time than, than they do apparently in Scotland or other countries. Um, another restriction is that we don't have an, uh, a nationally representative uh, GP register. So we are also missing out on some of the potential data uh, that exist in other countries. So yes, it is possible, but maybe we will have the answer by the end of the year while well, they had the answer after a few weeks. Okay. Maybe oh. if I um, isn't also part of the problem, um, taking responsibility. Um, some organization, it might be Sian San or someone else saying, we are responsible for this, we will do this and make sure it happens. Because I have the feeling that right now, everyone points to each other and says, well, that's for the regions, regions point point to the federal level, um, stuff like that happens and time get lost uh, in that way. If, yeah. if I can take a specific example from last summer, um, apparently Belgium had a wonderful system of registering the, the passenger locator forms um, that was demoed in, in all of Europe, um, if I may believe the, the responsible minister. Um, but the data from that system was kept inside the system and wasn't used to do any analysis of some sort. So we had epidemiologists, uh, statisticians who were, who were wanting to do analysis of the effect of, of travelers, but they couldn't get the data. Um, and everyone thought data is available or it isn't up to me to make it available. So nothing happened. Yeah, it would of course be a, a lot easier, but most of those questions would require a strong legal basis. And these legal aspects are 
sometimes uh, standing in the way of, of a more efficient and, and a quicker um, analysis of data. So one of the things that we will try to do within the, the project that I already mentioned was to evaluate um, what the legal basis for, for health data are in Belgium um, and which options there would be to, to improve that. Um, and for instance, you've heard of the, the new uh, law on pandemics that is in development. Hopefully there, there can be a, a very strong and explicit uh, paragraph on, on the use and reuse of data to make sure that we can act in a much quicker way than we would be able to do today. Karen, do you have any background on this or anything to add? Yeah, I can only agree that indeed, um, yeah, we are in different situations here for, for example, for EMA da data, uh, but also for other databases in Belgium that exist since uh, some time, there is a legal basis for access. It is not um, sufficient, okay, but there is already a legal basis. And these are also routine data. So data that are, and that is the problem, data that are not collected for the purpose of research but for other purposes so i understand that if there is a new database uh, like the one uh, bart is talking about the passenger um, uh, data on uh, on covid tests then yeah it it is a new database that has been collected for another purpose than for research and it's not um, yeah, there is no legal basis for making them available for research. So uh, I, I, I can only agree that there is room for improvement uh, on the use of this kind of routine data, ex uh, especially when they are new, because for existing databases, we have some uh, uh, elaborate uh, legal basis. But I, I think this might be part of the problem because if you want to set up a system for registering passenger locator forms, yeah, one of the obvious things you would want to do with it is actually use the data. Um, so maybe they should have thought of that when they were setting up the database and, and um, designing the system. I see, I see the chat also blowing up a little bit. Uh, this topic is, is striking a nerve, which is good. Um, I just saw one. I would strongly disagree that common good justifies infringing on data privacy. There's an article that allows linking personal data for COVID-19 and it's not even acceptable even by the WHO. There are alternative solutions like data intermediaries. So we need to look at alternative solutions, not more of the same solutions. Could any anyone reply to this by Isabel de Zeger? How do you feel about the tension between the individual and the common good? Well, and I think these are the questions that we have to be very open and explicit about and, and try to find the uh, um, yeah, a common uh, ground. So um, I, I would be very happy to, to learn about uh, these alternative solutions. I would also be very happy to learn more about why, uh, according to the, the person in the chat, um, this uh, wouldn't be allowed because we know from other uh, examples that um, approvals are being given both in Belgium and, and in other countries. So again, I'm very open and, and interested to learn more from different people who have their own specific uh, expertise and experience in this domain. Try to learn more and try to be open um, about uh, the use and reuse of such data and of course all the implication that that brings uh, with it. Yes. Okay, uh, do Bart or Karen want to add something to this? Um, well, maybe, yeah. Uh, um, I see the problem with, with um, specific privacy sensitive data. Um, but um, like I said, you have to make distinction between 
data for, for research up to personal level, which may or may not be needed, and the open data. And of course, um, in the open data, um, no uh, identifiable um, stuff should be present, um, except maybe if the person explicitly allowed for that. How, yeah. how do people I, now... Sorry, yeah. Karen, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I, I would like to... Uh, um to affirm this um, and also um, also make the comment that even if private privately I, data that are uh, sensitive to privacy issues when they are made available to users and that can even be individual data there are different legal and ethical steps that are taken such that they cannot be misused by users and it has to be do with anonymization with pseudonymization and also with restricting the data explicitly to the research question of the user so even if you have access to privacy sensitive information it doesn't mean that you can identify the people and that is the environment that is set up and has to be expanded to make these data available to 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 interested users yeah. so it doesn't mean so I, just the point i want to make is that if you have private data um, for example i'm working with uh, all your private data uh, all all day long and my colleagues are also but i cannot identify you i can even not can identify myself, even if I have a lot of information about myself. I hope that that answers Isabel's question a little bit. Uh, and I hope to invite her um, in a moment to also speak about this. And I see Joram uh, responding with pseudo -anon anonymized data is still risky to publish as open data in, in his opinion. Um, I wonder but I think yes. that also re refers back to what I was saying before. So there's no black and white, very clear, good answer to what is acceptable. So it's even though there is legislation, it still remains up to the, the data provider, the DPO of the organization to decide what is possible or not. And nowadays, as I said before, we see that in some organizations, there's more a tendency to be more restrictive than not restrictive because if something would happen then of course all the uh, responsibility falls within that organization so this is something that we need to be aware of um, i don't have an immediate solution to that but i think uh, countering that with positive scientific examples of how they can be used in a in a good way um, is at least a, a good start to that answer yes and if anybody in the chat has some of those uh, positive examples, feel free to talk about those as well. So I hear that even though we would have a legal framework that would make valorizing this data uh, easier, it's still up to the people using it to interpret it in the right way and to use it in the right way. I, As I understood, Karen, you also at IMOA make sure that people are educated in a certain way to uh, you help them ad hoc and you help them personally to reach the correct data. Do you also have to support them in how to use that data and what to do with it in, in the GDPR atmosphere? Yeah, on the legal issues, indeed, we, um, <clears throat> yeah, we um, help users in defining the data that they need for their research and to um, our... Um, uh, our role is then to find a balance between um, the privacy issues, huh? what data do you need for your research, and um, and the availability of the data. So, um, um, as uh, the, the the role of the DPO has here been uh, pointed out, so our DPO will for each request that a user um, has for our data will evaluate cell per cell, variable per variable, 
whether they are really needed for the research and whether um, they do not uh, include the risk of or high or low risk for ad identification of individuals. And depending on the uh, depending on the, the the conclusions of the DPO, sometimes um the data are refused to uh, to be used in by by researcher or they are obliged to only work with a sample or things like that so we uh, we we try to help users to define their data in such a way that their request at the data protection authority will be uh, accepted and that is um yeah a sort of uh, service that um, is needed and will be needed to help researcher in the access to data even if all technical issues will be in place in the future for yeah a large um, health database in belgium that sounds extremely labor intensive but justified would there be a way to make that easier that process because it, it feels like when we're in the middle of a chaos that might be unmanageable almost no you, it, it's labor intensive you really need uh, personnel for that so uh, we as a researcher we know this the policy makers that are thinking of big health data are, are not always aware of it so it is overall to make them aware of it it is labor intensive but it can also um be picked up by uh, generic tools and that is what we try to develop as well that means detailed information on our websites uh, clear procedures that uh, everybody has access to metadata on our website explaining our data explaining every variable in our data set and so on so the development of these de generic tools also helps the uh, the users to accelerate their pathway into the access of the data so it's it's in progress i'm going to ask bart what would you need from such tools what what, what do you need to advance to valorize our health data well i think maybe if, if i go back a little for one thing the um, the um the support and and applying especially the legal support is very valuable because yeah, we're researchers. The legal parts are not our core business. We want to do research and and not uh, get involved in the legal stuff. And it, it's it's complicated. I think the, the the improved attention to privacy is definitely a good thing. Um, but a side effect is that yeah, a, a lot of a lot more people are um, maybe um, yeah, extra sensitive for those kind of arguments um, and that in bigger organizations um, the number of, of legal people uh, went up in the in the recent years i think um, brecht might also comment on that how, how that's going in, in Cienzano, for example um, and then with respect to the metadata it's also very important because um, if you don't know what the data represents it's it's very hard to work with it um, so, so you need the, the extra information um, to correctly interpret uh, the data yeah and if i may add to that i think this discussion also points another general thing that i that i want to uh, note is that um, making best use of such data requires a strong and positive collaboration between researchers and and data holders and i think this is something that we should all be be aware of um but maybe this is not yet the case today um but such collaboration is sometimes uh, even inevitable you cannot use the ema data without having ever contacted ema for instance but i think with the examples that karen gave is that these organizations are also putting in place efforts to really help researchers. And the processes needed to be able to have access to these data are very complicated for outsiders, um, but they are there to really help you, uh, guide you through the process. Uh, they implement some of the steps of the process themselves, so they are really there to, to support you. And this is also one of the, yeah, the key philosophies that I want to uh, um, promote uh, through my work and, and my future projects is that um, we can, the, the best way forward is together. 
So as data holders, we should all um, understand and, and realize that external valorization of our data is very valuable, sometimes even necessary. At the same time, data uh, users, researchers should understand that um, the, the data holders are there to help, but are also the ones who have best knowledge about these data. So even if the technical processes and the legal, et cetera, have been uh, carried out, there is still a big win in, in having a good and solid collaboration with the, the data holders in order to make sure that the, the conclusions that you are drawing from the data are indeed valid and correct. So there's a, a big win in working together, um, but this requires that yeah, the researchers understand that uh, this collaboration can be in their own uh, value and that the data holders understand that external valorization of the data can be in their uh, benefit. I'm going to point to the chat for a second, because I do think I agree that collaboration is the only way up, right? Um, I see questions passing by about metadata. Um, they want explanations of what it re represents, where it comes from, how it can be interpreted from Geert, for instance. And uh, Karen also replied already to that by um, informing us that they're working on tools to make that more available. Um, I also see that there are ways to um, identify without, um, well, infringing on privacy, if I understand correctly. Does anybody want to reply on what they're seeing in the chat? Do you have access to the chat, by the way? Okay. Who would like to respond to Geert, for instance? And maybe I can also uh, unmute Geert. Give me a second to find him, sorry. I need... Okay, I think I did it, Geert, if you refresh then probably you can do the echo test and then uh, we can have you live on screen as well. I think you will have to refresh first. So Geert is talking about metadata while he refreshes maybe uh, who would like to pick in on this. Maybe Bart, from your experience, um, you can talk about this as well. Yeah, like I said uh, um, a few minutes ago, I think it's extremely important to, to correctly interpret the data. Um, not only how it how the data was collected, um, but also if there might be some unintended um, side effects uh, due to the way it's collected. Um, so that's very valuable to understand. If I go back to the COVID situation, for example, um, the the number of tests that are reported are reported on the, the day that the test was executed but if you look at the case data they are reported on um the same the day the sample was taken um so that's a, a subtle distinction um but if you don't take that into account you can it can lead to two wrong uh, conclusions who do you turn to when there are these subtle differences that you can have figure out is this also the data provider that you will contact yeah, so I think um, Cianzano has been going has been doing a good job actually. Um, aside from the the comments that that they that they um, don't provide um, mm -hmm. an, enough open data, but the data they provide um, is machine readable in, in an okay format, so CSV format, JSON format. Um, they have, uh, I think it's called the cookbook, where they explain all the variables um, and and what they should represent. Um, so, so they're doing that in a, in a good way. Maybe only um, the license, the exact license of the data is missing, um, but generally it's okay. And if I have a question, I, I uh, talk to Brecht. <laughs> talk to Brecht. Okay. I see, I see some principles about fair passing by, and I'd love to address Karen in a moment um, for this. But uh, can... Can Brecht and Karen maybe first explain a bit about the metadata standards? How are you working with these? Maybe just a quick thought on that from my side. So when looking at the different um, data sources that exist within Belgium, I, I don't think that they all have the same level of 
uh, or that they all report their metadata in the same way. And I know Ima has done a, a good job in uh, in developing their own metadata portal. So thanks a lot for that. But I think there's indeed uh, uh, much to be gained by further developing, even harmonizing or standardizing the, the metadata descriptions across the different health data sets that, uh, that exist within Belgium. Maybe uh, Karen can uh, yeah, comment on that. Uh, yes, indeed, we have uh, we are in the course of developing our metadata. It's a very labor intensive uh, work. We are now one year further, and I think we are about in one third of our uh, description of our variables. Um, I see there indeed passing uh, what standards do you follow? We try to follow standards of administrative description of administrative data sets. So that are routine collected data. And these are very different from um, data that are uh, collected, for for example, in the fra frame of clinical uh, clinical research. So there are different types of standards that have to be followed depending on the data source itself. We try to um, uh, de to develop our data so such that they respond indeed and uh, the word has been um, uh, picked up um, or proposed by Isabel de Zeger, uh, fair principles so that our data are findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And um, we will be happy to work together with uh, the other data providers in Belgium from the moment they're this will be developed at a more integrated national level and to share our experiences or input and to um, maybe standardize even more in uh, in relation to the other data sources in Belgium or international sources. I'm going to call here to the stage. Uh, you've been very active in the chat, um, not just about metadata, but also privacy control on a national level. Tell us about this. What would you like to ask our panel members? Yes, uh, do you hear me? Okay, fine. Um, well, uh, I have a lot of experience in, 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 in medical uh, uh, environments, also with uh, uh, data analysis and, and data privacy. I have worked uh, uh, 21 years uh, with uh, Proximus, Belgicom Proximus. Uh, 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 so, yes. Um, well, my major concern here is clear metadata and unique, uniquely describing each of the of the attributes of the data, and that cannot be misunderstood by 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 uh, the users. Um, the biggest um, risk is that uh, some data is is interpreted in 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 a wrong way, wrong units, or uh, wrong. Um, yeah. Uh, or in the way you can use the, the data. So, yes, there is no one, one single solution. It's a, response, it's a, a shared responsibility. And uh, I think one, one platform that can be used by all of the parties uh, should make a, a large uh, difference. Okay. Yeah. If I may maybe um, follow up on that. So one of the questions that we had in the chat was uh, from Marco, where does the standardization and harmonization um, take place? Uh, there were also questions before on the, um, oh, I forgot it, I lost it here, on the EU Data Governance Act. So at the moment, there are a lot of things moving in, in Europe and there's also in Belgium to try to set up um, a national health data authority, or at least to bring the key people within the Belgian health information system together within, um, within, uh, yeah, a consortium or at least a, a brainstorming group um, that can uh, accommodate the, the requirements of the Data Governance Acts. So one of the possible um, objectives or act activities of this uh, data authority could be to think about uh, harmonizing and standardizing the, the metadata across the different partners that will be um, involved in this uh, authority. 
And this can then be one step towards uh, a much longer term uh, perspective, perspective of having a, a, a more fully integrated um, health data system. Um, but at least this is um, what is currently being uh, put in place. And um, yeah, I strongly see this as a big uh, step forward in the Belgian health information system. Can, can you tell us more about this? Is there is there a place that some space that we can go or people we can talk to because I've I've heard from different people like they're they're okay criticizing perhaps but mostly what I hear from all sides is we want to come together is there a way to get in touch or to, how to get involved yeah so the idea within the, the data governments act and the health data authority would be to have uh, um, or to bring together the key players within the, the health information system. So that is not necessarily the same goal as uh, reaching out to, say, the general public, if, if that's what you are referring to. Um, but I think we should try to aim further than what is uh, asked for in, in the Data Governance Act and also increase the visibility of the Belgian health information system, uh, not just to the people who are closely involved, but also to the outside world. Um, and this is linked to, uh, amongst others, the concept of the, the national nodes, which have been proposed in the framework of uh, several EU health information projects that we have also been uh, leading within Cienciano. Um, and there, there could be a, a strong potential to um, create, for instance, uh, um, a group that is able to be contacted and to uh, reach out to the general public, uh, maybe even have annual seminars where we can bring the people together, present them what we do, how they can work together, ask experts and researchers to present how they have used the data so that there can be a much stronger and much more open and explicit interaction between data holders, data users, um, privacy advocates, and other people who have an interest in health data. Because I do think we have a lot of education to do. I hear voices on one hand saying, I don't trust the government with my data, but on the other hand, they use ways and just put their data out there like it's nothing. So I think we have some work to do there. Um, but we have a couple of minutes left. Um, and what I hear most is this collaboration. We have been spared from pandemics like COVID-19 for a long time, and we know that there will be more challenges coming up, maybe a different pandemic or other challenges that we will face. So this, this collaboration might be able to prepare us for the future. Um, I would like to involve the audience I would like to, to today um, not just speak to the, the, well, the experts, let's say, because we need the public to also understand. I'm going to uh, unblock, can we, can we unblock everyone, Astrid? Yes, I will do that now. That is nice, thank you. Um, so we know which data we have. We know what we need to valorize them in order to enhance our society. We know the challenges we will face uh, when we try to valorize this data. We, we know we already have some hurdles, um, but we all face those new challenges, with, which ne means we need a common understanding, a framework to answer those, those new questions that will rise um, so we can, can prepare the public for, hey, we might need your data for the common good. This framework can fuel openness and collaboration between data holders, scientists, and us as individuals. I would like to ask everyone in this panel, but also the people in, um, in the chat, to tell us what would you like to see in this set of values? And I saw Isabel de Zeger already mentioned FAIR. Karen also uh, touched on this already. What would you like to contribute to this set of values? And I'm going to ask Karen first, and then maybe uh, Isabel can also tie into this. What, what do you see in this set of values that can prepare us for the future? Uh, so yeah, uh, what I already said, um, 
the FAIR principles are guiding principles in making data accessible. And I think um, uh, we should, um, these are uh, internationally recognized principles. And I think we should, um, from our sides, data providers, uh, make efforts to to uh, to meet these principles. So not to invent new ones or this is a, a nice framework. Um, yeah, let us stick to it and let us, uh, in the first place, try to meet these principles from yeah from our side. Isabel, maybe you can also uh, refresh so that we can can hear you if you would like to come to the stage. If not. Uh, you can definitely just type out what you think, and otherwise uh, we will give you a moment to refresh and then go through the echo test. Um, but I wonder, um, what do you think about this? Is this framework sufficient to get started from? Or do you say like, hey, this is a first step we need to take um, into educating our audience? How do you feel about this? Can you hear me? Yes, I can yes. hear you. Go ahead. It's hard to go up and in. Wonderful. So, yes, thank you. And again, so I'm a physician, computer scientist with uh, 30 years of experience in health and pharma. And I'm also a member of an organization called My Data. And the key there, uh, and after a quite a lot of time looking at, at data, is that you put the individual at the center. They control the data within what is uh, a data intermediary as part of the EU Data Governance Act. And if they do that, then they can be in control and decide to share or not to share. So privacy can be solved. And there are a lot of standards behind that. And on top of that, if you integrate the data at the level of the individual, you can also then solve a lot of the interoperability problems. And so, Breck, when I was saying alternative solution, I think the way we work today is problem centric. We want to solve a problem and we collect and manage data to solve the problem. We have to look at a different way, which is to look at individual centric. And whenever there is a problem, to ask the patient or the citizen to share their specific data to help solve the problem. And if we look at that way, I think it opens a lot of possibility. And the EU Data Governance Act, I think, allows to regulate the organization that will do that. And it's extremely powerful. Thank you for that, Isabel, because I think Bart also um, touched upon this shortly um, because he said, uh, is there a way for citizens to decide themselves who they want to share their data with? To which Raf responded, the solid project is working on personal health data. So that would mean you are owner of your own data. And whenever somebody asks for your data, you can say yes or no if they're very transparent about uh, what they're going to do with this data. Um, Bart, are you here? Would you also like to add something? Or maybe Raf? You can refresh and then go through the echo test and add. Uh, I saw everyone nodding vigorously. Um, go ahead. Um, yeah, maybe with respect to privacy, a good rule of thumb is always to um, not do things with data that um, isn't expected by by the 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 person that it's about um except of course everyone has different expectations so it's it's sometimes hard to to find a, a middle ground of, of what can a person expect that his data um will be used for um so i think that's important um maybe um on a more practical level i think what we missed here and already touched upon this is um some kind of um, central um, responsible agency um, that maybe not not um, not is, is is responsible for um, for making available all data, but but at least a central point where you can ask questions and they figure it out or, or redirect to to where you have to be. Because right now. Um, you can send emails to people and then it gets forwarded and forwarded. And um, in the end, you sometimes end up where you started. Uh, so it's not clear um, who's responsible and, and where you have to be, even if you want to to formally request some some data. Yeah, I, I, I see Bart, you are in contact with Karen or the organization Karen works for. 
Um, you say it's it's valuable, the help that everyone provides there. You're in contact with Brecht. But Brecht and Karen, are you, for instance, working together or, or how are your organizations working together right now? Um, yeah, Cienzano has permanent access to our data. It is one of the public institutions that uh, uh, by law have access to our data, such as the Federal Planning Bureau as well and RISIF INAMI as well or the Health uh, Knowledge Center, the KCE. So uh, that is uh, one part of the collaboration. And then we work together on different uh, uh, individual projects. And how do you stand, um, or, or what is your opinion, Brecht, on the, on the FAIR system? Um, because Karen, as she said, we already have a decent set. We don't re need to reinvent the wheel. Um, how do you feel about this? Yeah, I think, as I said before, it would be useful if the different players could uh, use the same set of, of uh, metadata tools. At the same time, I think it will always remain necessary to to have this, this close and constructive collaboration, eh? because even with detailed metadata, you will never have the same level of knowledge as the people at IMA, for instance, have on their own data. So there will always remain a, a big win in, in setting up uh, and maintaining a close and good collaborations uh, between uh, yeah, researchers and, and data holders, data managers. Um, but uh, I fully also agree with what Bacht was uh, referring to, to have uh, in, in our terminology, we call that the one-stop shop. And if you can say that 10 times after each other, then you can join Cienzano. Um, but a one-stop shop for health information, health data, like a central hub, which already exists in some other countries, um, which doesn't have access to all the data, but at least has a broad overview and can put you in contact with the right people or refer you to the right websites. Um, but then at least you only need to um, remember one uh, one name of a website and not uh, thousands of different names. So that can already be a help um, to yeah, start finding your way in the Belgian health information landscape. This collaboration is being brought to life, as I understand. How can we keep up to date about its whereabouts and maybe that one-stop shop website will come to life? Where, where, where will we find this information? How will we discover? Yeah, um, so once it is in place, we would be very happy, of course, to share uh, the the information with, with your uh, group and organization. Um, at the moment, we don't have any yeah, uh, concrete details yet, but uh, the idea would be when this will be in place that it will be disseminated in a, in a wide uh, way. And at least you can uh, already start by following me on Twitter and then- uh, Okay, how can we help you? Yeah. How, what, what, uh, if you, you three had a question for the audience, how could we help you tell us what you need? Because I'm going over time. I'm sorry. It's very interesting. I'll end with this question. Well, I would say in general, keep being interested in health data, even if COVID will, uh, hopefully disappear. Cause there are a lot more health issues that need to be tackled where there is a lot of valuable uh, expertise uh, in academia and, and other places. So please remain interested in uh, in health and health data and help us solve the, the problems that we are facing today. Karen, do you have a question for our audience? Uh, yes, uh, I, I would like to... Uh... To add to what uh, Brecht says, uh, feedback from users is of uh, invaluable information for data providers. And uh, yeah, if you have uh, questions, comments, uh, please let us know. Do you also have a Twitter account or somewhere people can ask those questions? Because I'm going to now plug Brecht's Twitter, <laughs> yeah. then Bart's and yours. The easiest way is through our uh, website or contact point on the website. Okay, contact point on the website. Uh, can you remind me where it is later in the chat so I can send it to everyone? Yeah, just email contact and you will find it. Okay, okay. And Bart, what is your question to the audience? 
Yeah, um, I would like to echo what, what Brex said, but but not only feedback is not only important for data providers, but also for people doing things with the data because um, after a while you become sort of an, an expert with the data and it's not always clear what the general audience um, expects of it or how they understand it. And by getting feedback, by getting questions, um, you get to a better end result and you improve on that. So I think that's important. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, this was very interesting. Thank you for your time. Uh, yeah, this was very valuable. <laughs> Astrid probably wants to add something. And uh, if you want to stick around or ask some questions, that's uh, totally fine. I don't know if Bert, Brecht and, and Karen still have some time. You can stick around as long as you like. Uh, and engage yeah, with and just want to add also thanks to the people uh, listening and the people who contributed in the chat. So um this shows that there's a lot we can learn from each other and i'm looking forward to continuing that in the future mm -hmm. um i suggest that we end the recording now but that we keep the chat open for a few more minutes um so the speakers if they have time uh can still uh reply to to some questions if there are any